Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. With a diameter of 5,150 kilometers, it is larger than the planet Mercury. Its diameter also implies that its surface area is 83 million kilometers square. That is very close to the surface area of Asia and Africa combined. The most remarkable feature of this enormous moon are its lakes. They are composed of liquid methane and ethane. And although they are very impressive, they are relatively speaking just a small part of its surface. The most dominating feature of Titan, surface-wise, besides the flat plains, is its gigantic equatorial dark desert. It covers about 13% of the entire surface area of Titan, meaning it has a surface area of about 10 million kilometers square. That is a bit larger than the surface area of the United States. The lakes of Titan, on the other hand, cover about 1.1% of the surface area of Titan, which is 910,000 kilometers square. That is still large in some sense, but it pales in comparison to the 10 times greater surface area of the equatorial desert. NASA's Cassini probe that reached Saturn in 2004 also visited Titan, and with the help of its radar, it managed to image the surface of Titan. Radar had to be used, because at visible wavelengths, the view of the surface is entirely obscured due to a hazy atmosphere that is also four times thicker than that of the Earth. So what the Cassini probe revealed in these dark desert regions are massive sand dunes. They are around 100 meters tall, one kilometer wide, and can be up to many hundreds of kilometers long. So these dunes are massive. Now the sand composition of this massive desert is very likely very different from the ones on Earth. On Earth, desert sand is mostly composed of silicates, but on Titan, there are indications that the sand is mostly made up of organic matter, so matter that has carbon. The organic sand sea, as shown in these images of Titan, is clearly frequently interrupted by these islands. They have the higher ground and have indications that they are composed of water ice. That also suggests that all of that sand of the desert sits on top of a water ice bedrock. Water ice at the temperatures of Titan, which are around minus 180 degrees Celsius, acts more like rock does on Earth. The lower the temperature, the harder the water gets. The most prevailing winds on Titan are blowing west, at a maximum speed of 3.6 kilometers an hour but the dunes of Titan point east. This means that the most prevailing winds of Titan, which at best are blowing at a speed of 3.6 kilometers an hour, are not sufficiently powerful for them to be forming the massive sand dunes. So something else is going on. One solution to this problem says that every time when Titan is in equinox, when it has days and nights of equal length, which happens about every 15 years, that is when intense methane storms form. And as a result of that, winds at speeds of about 36 kilometers an hour start blowing eastwards. These winds are powerful enough to move the grains of sand, which is why the dunes are aligned eastwards, despite the most prevailing winds blowing west. Researchers also found that the sand grains of Titan's deserts are likely relatively tightly held together by static electricity. The sand grains on Titan are most likely hydrocarbons. The dark color of the dunes in radar images suggests that. Also, some commonly used plastics on Earth are hydrocarbons. Now, hydrocarbon grains on Titan likely have a density about one-third that of the sand on Earth. Also, the gravity of Titan is lower, and the atmosphere is very dry. All of those factors, together, suggest that the sand grains of the dunes of Titan build up immense charges, which causes them to be very sticky. The material and the stickiness 
is analogous to packing peanuts, which stick very easily. Now, the stickiness of the dunes also indicates why the general light breeze of Titan going westwards is not enough to move dunes. The dunes are held together through static electricity. And again, only the one in every 15 years methane storm that causes strong winds to blow eastwards is enough to cause the sticky dunes to align. Electrostatic charging is also how the sand on Titan likely formed in the first place. The grains were likely not created through erosion of the waterized bedrock, which is what one theory proposes, since studies of the composition of the dunes show that they have very little water compared to the rest of the surface. Rather, electrostatic charging could occur in microscopic smog particles in Titan's atmosphere causing them to stick together, grow, and eventually fall to the surface. The interesting thing is, is that we have images from the surface that were captured near the Shangri-La region. Shangri-La is just one of the names for a part of the desert. Some of the other names for other large parts are Belet, Senkyo, and Fensal. So the surface images that I am talking about are the ones from the Hygens lander. The Hygens lander was attached to the mentioned Cassini spacecraft. And Hygens managed to land on Titan on January 14th, 2005. And after its landing, it lasted for an hour before it sent its last signal. Now, during the descent of Hygens towards Titan, Pretty good images were captured from above. It captured the area close to the dunes of the Shangri-La Desert. Hygens also landed directly on the darker region with more hydrocarbons, and not on the bright region which has more exposed water ice. Upon landing on the surface, it stirred up a cloud of dust that lasted for 4 seconds. The analysis of the data from the lander also shows that the ground Hygens landed on is pretty much sand. The rocks in the images are between 15 to 5 centimeters in length, and they are well rounded. That suggests that liquid acted upon them, so maybe there was once liquid in this region. Above the ground images upon descent also showed what appears to be drainage channels. Some analysis of the topography of Shangri-La in the rest of the equator also suggests that since there are deep enclosed spots that possibly that is where methane rain can accumulate and form lakes even if there is not much rain but those lakes even if they exist would likely be not that big at least nowhere near as big as the lakes on the poles of titan if they were large they would easily evaporate on the equator the greater surface area causes greater evaporation. However, there is no hard evidence of lakes existing on the equator of Titan as of yet, despite the possibility. This dark desert of Titan almost runs along the whole equator. It is interrupted by the bright, massive Xanadu region that is the size of Australia. Xanadu interrupts Shangri-La rather abruptly and the terrain on Xanadu is filled with many hills, mountains, and valleys. Some of the structures that it has are very convoluted and labyrinth-like. It also has some lines that have a pattern which suggests tectonic activity. Xanadu also has three massive mountain ranges called Midri Montes. They are essentially ridges separated by around 25 kilometers and the mountain range ridge at the bottom of this image is where the highest known peak is located on Titan. It is 3,337 meters high. Xanadu was also known since 1994 because the Hubble Space Telescope through infrared saw the region. It stood out as something bright and large. Hubble, also way back then, in the 90s revealed strong hints that there is liquid methane on Titan. That is why the Hygens lander was also designed to land on a liquid surface as well 
just in case. The Earth has a gravity seven times greater than the one on Titan, so Titan's surface gravity is pretty much on par with the surface gravity of the Moon, Luna. But also Titan has a four times thicker atmosphere than the Earth. Interestingly, both Earth and Titan have mostly nitrogen in the atmosphere. So because Titan has a very significant atmosphere and because it has a low gravity, achieving flight on Titan is rather easy. So knowing that, NASA is preparing a rotorcraft for Titan. The mission is called Dragonfly. This rotorcraft should land directly in the Shangri-La region. So it will get to see the massive sand dunes. Then it will take a series of flights going towards the crater called Selk. It is a young 90 km long crater. Dragonfly should be able to achieve a series of flights that go for 8 km per flight. Its maximum speed should be about 36 km an hour. And it also should be able to go 4 km above the ground. It is expected that this rotorcraft will manage to fly a distance of 175 km on Titan. For comparison, NASA's Opportunity rover that was active on Mars for about 14 years traveled a distance of about 45 kilometers. So all in all, the Dragonfly mission is very exciting. Some amazing images of Titan's surface up close are going to come out of it. And with that, new discoveries. The launch date for Dragonfly is currently planned for 2027. And if that happens, then it will arrive on Titan by 2034. However, the launch has a possibility of being postponed, as that frequently happens with NASA missions. Even if that is the case, it's certainly worth it to wait a bit more in order to ensure that this fascinating mission doesn't fail.